I got sick the second half of the trip, so I was kind of sad about that, but I, I plan to redeem myself when I go back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it was good yeah that's pretty much been it from my end and i'm moving soon closer to my parents oh are you okay yeah, yeah that's pretty much it how about you right. okay. oh man just been busy doing all kinds of things here in ghana <laughs> Hey, I see you. Hey. Hey, how y'all doing? Can you hear me okay? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. All right. So hey, just let y'all know the, the electricity is out here, okay. but we have this kind of crazy half electricity and half not. So I have lights in here, but that's it. So I don't know what will happen at some point. If it drops, I'll call in on my phone. Okay. Sounds good. Well, now that everybody is on here, how are y'all doing? Good. How, how, are you? how are you? Good. good. Warm, everybody. I, I, I'm going to show my face, but I, I'm eating right now. Okay. <laughs> hey, sister girl, Karen, Karen, Karen. What's up? What's up? Girl. What's up? <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's so nice to see y'all. Right. Nice to see you. I'm not, sure. I'm not showing my face yet until after Denise announced me. <laughs> okay. I'll make like my when you pull interest. the curtain back. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, we got to hey, see Shalom. that pretty face. Shalom. Shalom, sis. How are you? Wonderful. Good to hear your voice. Yes. I'm glad to be here. Yeah. Y'all know it's 11 you're right. Oh, yeah. PM. So thank you for thank you. making that sacrifice. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> thank you. I had to take a nap. <laughs> oh, I know that's right. Thank you, Kim. Thank you, Kim. <laughs> well, now that everybody's hey, now that everybody's joining on, um, I'll just do a quick welcome. Hey, hey um, Mr. Carl, I'm sorry. <laughs> Shalom, Mama Nita. Is there a delay? Can y'all hear me? Yes. Okay. All right. Well, I just wanted to thank everybody for joining the platform tonight and taking time out of your busy schedules to join us. Um, on behalf of Mara, she is on a sabbatical right now, uh, so she won't be able to join us, but she wanted to leave us with a special treat tonight. So with that being said, I'll turn it over to Ms. Nisi. All right. Well, that was um, very direct, and I am ready. <laughs> so I just um, want to thank the Most High, yeah, for the opportunity that I have to be on here with y'all and tell you how much that I appreciate just being able to have this platform, even you know when we do get a chance to gather this way even though it's not like um on a regular basis like it was before but how much more of a treat it is when we do still get together like this so and i'm grateful for everyone here and um especially for my mom miss karen denise karen king aka karen in ghana and it's like i could ask myself what could i say about her and i could go on and on but i just want to be really transparent and say what a awesome woman of Yah that she is. Ever since I have been young, she has led me in the ways of righteousness to the level of understanding of the Most High that he gave at the different points throughout her life, throughout my life. And we have always just you know, done what we could to seek after him. And he has met us, he has met her and her life is to me an example it is exemplary of just faith and trust in our creator in the one who made her and it's evident because look at her now she's in ghana she moved out of this continent <laughs> at the behest of 
the creator, the one who told her to go. And she has gone boldly and she has done it with grace and with just dignity. Um, you know, for those of you who follow her on YouTube or, you know, on any social media, you you get a glimpse into what her life has been like over there. Um, but those are moments that she's chosen to capture and then that be even more edited down by me <laughs> before they make it onto uh, certain platforms. But she's she's experienced some high highs and some low lows and everything in between. But she is walking in a way that is just a light to this world. So her go going there, expecting to just be chilling, hanging out with the village children and being everybody's giggy to now the most high saying, no, you're going to start a business. You're going to be building homes. You're going to create a community for the diaspora, Africa by uh, construction and management services. I mean, this is major stuff. And she's, like I said, she's just doing it in trust because it's not like this is something that she was expecting but she's just walking in faith. And it makes me think about, it's like a little um, cartoon where it's a person who steps off of a cliff, but they can't see that the Most High is gonna put the step in front of them. He just told them to go. And so she's gone and he continued to uphold her, even though she don't ne necessarily know what the next day may hold. But he's definitely upholding her and keeping her strong. And I'm just so grateful to, I get to call her mother and mama and mommy. And I love her dearly. So I present to you, Miss Karen King. All right. Thank you, sweetheart. Hey, y'all. <laughs> well, Aquaba from Ghana. <laughs> that means welcome. So, hey. It's so good to see y'all on here. I mean, y'all know I'm going to be there in a couple of weeks. I don't know if y'all know that or not, but please let's try to make make it happen that we get to see each other while I'm there. Yeah, we got to do it. We got to do it. But please, anyway, please, please. yes, yes, we got to do it. So um, before we get started, I would like um, Minister Carla, if she would just open us in prayer, please. You do that. Absolutely. Minister. Yeah, thank power you. you. Let's, let's all bow our heads. Abba Yah, we thank you once again for bringing us together in sisterly love. Abba, we just want to thank you for this platform on this evening. We want to thank you for uh, our niece that brought this all together. Father, we want to ask you for a special blessing for our sister Karen. Abba, we want to thank you for the mighty gift that you have given her and the works that she is doing over in Ghana. Father, we want to thank you for the works that she is doing, reaching out to your children, the diaspora that wants to come uh, and, and live in, in Africa. Abba, we just want to thank you. We want to ask you to continue to protect her, guide her. Abba, continue to bless her and her business. Multiply it in the name of Yeshia. And we just want to thank you once again yeah. for this opportunity. We come before you with all humbleness, love, and gratitude. We thank you in the name of our blessed Messiah, Ha'aman. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, sis, for that so much. So I want to start off by just encouraging you ladies to whatever you feel that the Most High is calling you to do, just jump out there and do it. It's a great adventure, right? It's a great adventure. It may be scary. It may be um, expensive. It may be uh, life-changing, but if he's calling you to do something, just jump out there and do it. You will never regret it, right? You might, you might have some, like Denise was saying, I've had some high highs and some low lows, but overall, you will not regret it. So I just want to encourage you all, like if the Most High is telling you to do something and you're like, that can't be him because it's just too, it's too out there. It's too much, you know, but if you really believe in your Ruach, that is him, jump out there and do it. So I just wanted to start out by encouraging you to um, don't doubt, you know, like Denise said, step out off of that top of that mountain or whatever it is, and he will have you. And sometimes we step out maybe a little too soon. Sometimes we step out um, 
you know, uh, on the wrong step, but he will be faithful to lead and guide you. He said he would, right? He said he would lead and guide us every step of the way. So um, sometimes we might go a little bit astray, but if we are walking in him and walking in right standing with him, then he will bring us and, and guide us back. He uses the uh, the uh, Ruach HaKodesh to do that, the Holy Spirit for some, right? And he also uses his angels, his messengers to, to help guide us along the way. So we have so much help, right? And we have the word above everything else, right? So we just want to be uh, faithful to obey him because in these days and times, um, we're going to be called to do some things that we would never ever imagine that we would be called to do. Because these are times of of change. These are times of uh, of like elevation, like getting to another level. And so you want to make sure that you are in tune with him and being in tune with him that you then step out and obey. Don't talk yourself out of it because it's easy to do. You know, we've all done it, you know, and just say, oh, no, it can't be. Or, you know, maybe next year or maybe tomorrow. Um, you know, and tomorrow never comes, right? So I would just encourage you to be attentive to his his still small voice. And then when you believe it's him, you confirm it with the word, maybe talk to a good sister or something to help confirm it. You know, like I got my sister girls on this call, right? And then step out, you know, just step out. This is the time. And, you know, and I'm not, nothing against the men, but the most high is, you know, he is using his women and you know, he's using us to do some things that sometimes because maybe he can't get the men to do it. They may not. Or um, he sh he's shattering some of the, um, I guess, the old myths and the old ways of doing things. And if you go all the way back, you find out it's really not old. It's the way he's always done it. But people, we have changed it and made it a different way. But if you go back and you read the word, he's used us all the time in, in powerful ways. And he wants to do that again. So be encouraged, ladies, to um, step out there and do some great, great things for, for your Abba, because he's, he's going to use you to do that. Hallelujah. And that just was fresh off the press, because that was not part of my, <laughs> that was not part of what I was going to share with you guys tonight, but that came fresh off the press. So all praises to the most high for that. So anyway, how you guys doing? So, you know, if y'all want to do some chat, you know, chat, or you can, you can conversate with me. I haven't seen y'all in so long, right? A whole lot of y'all. So I don't care. Y'all can jump in right now. It'd be all right with me. <laughs> so Anyway, I'm just so grateful that you guys are here. I think that it might be good for me to share a little bit about my background, my history, how I got to Ghana for some of those of you who may not know. And um, so I guess it's been about what, eight years now, Nisi? Has it been really that long that since we awakened? Yep, eight years. Yeah. And um, when the Most High awakened us, we were all, you know, just so excited. We were angry. We, you know, how you go through all those stages, you know, uh, when you find out that we are the people and nobody told us, right? right. So when I when I did finally um, start walking, we all started walking in this truth. One of the things um, was a map. I just had in my mind to get a map of Africa, and I got this map, it's a long story how I got it, but eventually uh, a pastor gave me one of those real big maps that you get, um, that you have in school. If you remember like in elementary or junior high, you had these big old maps on the wall. And so I ended up with a map of Africa and when they brought it to my house, they left it in the foyer in the hallway. And every day when I would go, I worked at home, so I would have to walk past that map to go to work. And when I would walk past it, um, I would just hear the Ruach gently say, put your hand on it and pray. And so I did that for, you know, for a while. And, and I was like, what is this? You know, what's going on? Why, why am I doing this? Right. But when I would pray, it would just be such a deep prayer. And so I did that for a while. And then fast forward to um, finding out about a trip. Well, first I found out that they were giving away land uh, in Ghana. Right. So you could get 
uh, gifted land. I'm not going to say free because you had to pay for it, pay for it. At the time when they were giving away a plot of land, you would have to pay $700 for the um, administrative fee. And so when I heard about that online, I decided I'm getting some land. I, you know, I'll deed it to my grandkids or something, but I wasn't planning to go to Africa even at that time. I was just like, hey, get some land in Ghana. I'm going to do it. And then not long after that, I found out that there were a group of Israelites that were going to be going to Ghana on a trip. And so I felt like the most high was leading me to go to that. And that's what I'm saying. Like, if you just kind of get that little tug, you know, like more than likely, especially for something that you are not planning to do, be uh, brave, right? Have some courage and just say, you know what, this might be Abba telling me to do this. And then he'll open up those doors. I remember when I said I wanted to go, my girls were concerned because they didn't want me to go by myself. And then, but I was determined. I knew that I, you know, I really believed that he was leading me to go. So I was making preparations to go. And then at the, near the last moment, I found out that Cheryl, um, who, was, uh, who was in our assembly and Jay Shear, for those of you who know him, who had, he has his own assembly now, they both were going on that same trip. So it worked out that I wasn't going alone. So we all went to um, Ghana on this trip. And I tell you, ladies, when I got all, um, out of the airport and they had this big welcome for us with the dancers and the signs and they put these sashes around us, it was so amazing. And I felt so at home. And from that moment, it just got better and better and better from there. So as I was there each day, I was there, I just felt more and more like I belonged there. And so the, the Most High was confirming for me what he wanted to, to do. And the other thing that was so interesting too was that so many people look like people in America. As we're walking around, you know, and I'm be very honest and transparent. I thought that when I came here, the people were all gonna be really dark, you know, in my mind, the African look, right? And then when I got here, I saw all these people that look so much like us. I mean, I would see people that look like my my cousin, my my sister. I would do double takes sometimes because they would look so much like my family and friends. And and they were all different complexions, just like like we are. And that was surprising to me because I thought we had all these different complexions because of colonization, right? And the slave master adding a little of his flavor in there, right? But no, the Most High made us all these different beautiful colors. So it was just so beautiful when I got over there and see that a lot of these people, there was no, um, they had no mixture. That's just, the, that's just the way, the color the Most High gave them, this caramel and, and honey and, you know, all these beautiful, beautiful colors, coconut brown and, you know, all that. So that was another thing that was really kind of nice. It was nice. And then as time went on and we went to the slave dungeon and got to experience what our ancestors went through and the Most High um, had a had us go in, at night, in the dark of night. And there were some chiefs there that were dressed in their royal garb. And they um, we read scripture. We talked about they talked about the whole experience. And it was so moving and meaningful. And then we, they took some of the water because we were standing right there where at the door of no return where the people would come out and the ships would be there. And then uh, they had uh, big pots of that water for us to just kind of put our hands in that same water that our ancestors had um, been taken from. And we prayed and, and it was just a real spiritual moment. So that was significant. And then again, as time went on, I felt the stress leaving me, you know, each day I felt so much lighter and so much calmer. And, you know, I didn't realize at first what was happening, but then later I realized it was the stress of the West of the world, you know, on us from being in a tense, tense environment. And, um, and this could happen in other countries in Ghana too. I, I mean, in Africa too, I don't know. I only know about Ghana, but here the people were so laid back and, and easy, you know, sometimes a little too laid back for my taste, right? 
because they would be like, calm down, calm down, calm down, mommy, or um, I'm coming. So like I'm coming could mean just what it says, I'm coming. No time frame is associated with that. So for us, right, if I say I'm coming, that means I'm on my way. That doesn't mean that in Ghana. If they say I'm coming, that means I will be there at some point in time. So that was um, something that I had to get used to. But um, Denise is laughing because she experienced that as well. So the, the pace here is so slow that it's, it takes getting used to. But once you adjust to it, man, it's just so wonderful because you don't have all that pressure of having to do things so fast, like hurry up and eat your lunch, hurry up and, and fix dinner, hurry up and shop and hurry, you know, all that hurry. It's just not here. And so that was another great thing about it. But um, once I got here, I knew that I was going to come back here. And so the most I worked it out that I met someone and to help build my house. And I went through, you know, that. I, and, and let me say this too. Do your due diligence, ladies and gentlemen, ladies, I would say, and gentlemen, ladies, do your due diligence because just when the most high is leading you to do something, you can, we can get excited and we can run off half cocked. Some of us can. Some of us are very methodical and deliberate and won't do that because that's just not the way they're made. But so make sure that you are doing your due diligence. And I thought I was, but you know, later I can look back at some things that maybe I could have done differently, but I was so excited and so motivated that I made some decisions that I think, I, you know, hindsight is always 2020. I'm good, you know, but it, it was challenging. So, but anyway, I got my house uh, set up to be built. I came back. I told my family I'm I'm moving to Ghana, and you know I think they you know the initial shock of it. I think I might have mentioned it while I was still here. So to try to prepare them, I, I can't remember. Denise and Jessica, y'all remember? Did I tell y'all before I got back? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I don't I don't think you told me because you knew it was great. No. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway. Um, the thing about my daughters is that they know that I have a relationship with the Most High. So if I say that I believe that's what he's telling me to do, then they got in my corner. Same thing with my sister Kim. You know, they all were like, you know, I don't, they probably was talking about me behind my back. You know, I know they were like, she done lost her mind. <laughs> but, um, but they definitely was supporting me. And so I came back. In a few months, I, you know, I packed up everything. I started giving everything away. And, you know, I just, it was, it was a crazy time for me because as I was doing it, I was also having anxiety about it. I'm getting ready to move to a whole nother country by myself or on another continent. Right. And I don't know anybody except for the, the people that were building my house and nobody else is coming with me. I'm leaving my grandchildren, which was the major thing for me that, you know, caused me so much angst and my children. You know, I'm leaving my home, my um, my ministry work, everything. Um, and then I had to figure out how was I going to get all of this taken care of? How am I going to build this house? How am I going to do this? Well, the most high worked it out that I was able to raise my hand for a severance package. I had been on my job 31 years. They gave me the severance package and it happened to be double than what they typically would give. So he opened every door. So it was no way I could just say, oh, you know, this mustn't, this is not him because every step of the way he would open up another door and make it work and make it happen. So I, I knew that that's what I was supposed to do. But I had many moments of, you know, like sheer terror, you know, in the house by myself, like, what am I doing? I can't believe I'm going to be leaving my, you know? So, but, you know, you put on your happy face when you're around, you know, in front of people, but, you know, keeping it real, right? I'm just keeping it real here that sometimes the, the most high may call you to do something and it may be terrifying. 
but if you know it's him, you know, you still want to obey. And then, you know, I had, I had the shalom, you know, I had the shalom, but the, you know, just the human part of me, you know, was going through, but I just kept pressing on and pressing on. And so I ended up here in Ghana. I built this beautiful house um, that the most high, you know, graciously allowed me to build. And um, from here, I just, he opened up doors for me. I met great people. Like my business partner was um, Africa Bar Construction and Management Services, came to me and asked me if I would go into business with him. And I said, you know, because he saw that I had had some challenges with my home and, and the building and all that. And, and some other diasporans were having problems with being scammed and some of those things. And so he came and said, look, we can do a business where we can ensure that people are not going to go through that. Right. They're not going to have challenges. They're not going to have well, not any challenges, but not going to be scammed and not going to have these unnecessary challenges and things going on. And so I was like, oh, sure, I'll do that. I'll, I'll refer some people to you and you can, you know, d dash me a little something here and there for it. And he was like, no, no, I really believe, you, you know, you should be a partner, an equal partner with me in this business. And so I was like, oh, well, I got to pray about that because I'm planning to come. And spend time with the grand, you know, with the little children at the schools, and you know that kind of stuff. That I, you know, replace the grandchildren over here with mine. But the Most High had different plans for me. And next thing you know, I am in a business, starting a, a business, Africa Bar. And right after that, we did the Karen and Ghana uh, channel to sort of advertise and get it out there so that people would know. And the rest is history. The rest is history, y'all. So before I go any further, does anybody have any comments or questions or anything? Nope. All right. I um, I did I did, Sister Karen. Okay. Yes. Um, one of the biggest things that um, I guess I was interested in is, and I may have said it to you before. How do like my mother-in-law, she draws a uh, retirement and my husband draws disability. Can you yeah. hear me? Yes. How, how can we keep their retirement and disability going while we are over there? You can keep it um, as because you're not a citizen of the U.S., right? Yeah. I mean, I'm sorry, you're not a citizen of Ghana. So yes. like for me, my social security still comes every month in my bank account. Okay. In the U S I kept my bank in the U S and so the money goes into my bank account and then I just wire transfer it over, um, okay. to, my, to my bank in Ghana. And that's okay. totally, that's totally legal. You know, there's no issue with that at all. So you can do that. You just, um, you can still get your money. They won't say you can't because now you're living in another country. Now, when it comes that time to become a citizen, I will be, I will do dual citizenship. So I won't okay. give up my, I won't give up my U.S. citizenship. I'll just have, you know, add the Ghana citizenship to it, and that way that can continue to happen. Because I'm not okay. about to to give up what I've worked all these years for these few these few pennies that they've given me now, right? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, so well, thank yeah, you. So, yeah, does that help? Yes, it does. Okay. And also for people who have um if they have social security yeah, or if they have um medic Medicaid, right? Is it Medicaid? Is the one or is it Medicare? I don't I always mix them up. Some Medicare. Medicare. Yeah, some people okay. have both because I have both. Right. I have Medicaid okay. and Medicare. So oh yeah. okay. But Medicare, if you have that, you can still keep that too. Um, and your insurance and all of that, you can still keep. If you okay. want, if you, if you want to, you can still keep that because a friend of mine, Queen Moy, she just went back to the states so she could get her, you know, checkup and dentist and all that kind of stuff that she has through her Medicare. Okay, and, yeah. and did it cost? Did it cost a lot for you to get a vehicle over there? It didn't cost me a lot for the vehicle that I have. It was um, that vehicle I have. I paid six thousand U.S. 
for it. Okay. Um, to ship it over there? No, I didn't ship it. I bought it over here. Someone was selling it. And okay. He has he has shipped it over from the U.S. So, okay. I mean, the price of purchasing a car here is about this is about maybe five to ten thousand U.S. less than what you would pay. Sometimes more, depending on how okay. expensive the vehicle is. Okay. But for used used vehicles, you can get a good used vehicle for less than ten thousand, around ten thousand U.S. dollars. Okay. So, oh, praise. Mm -hmm. So sometimes it's not worth trying to ship it over because the e-levy tax that you have to pay when you get it here is so expensive. They, I think they do it to discourage you from bringing vehicles. They want you to buy the vehicles here. But some people will have their vehicles shipped to Togo, which is right next to Ghana, because okay. they, don't have, they don't have a tax um, at, the, um, at the dock. So okay. they do that and then they drive it into Ghana. Some people do that too. So all right. Thank you, sis. You're welcome. You're welcome. And Ghana also has its own um automobile company called Kantanka. And they they make these uh really nice um S SUVs and um trucks like the Ford F one fifty. They have yes. one that's like equivalent to that. And that one, fully loaded with everything brand new, is only thirty thousand U.S. compared okay. to where you're gonna pay what almost sixty or seventy thousand in in the states. That's what I heard it costs now. So, yeah, you can you can do that. When you first get here to Ghana, you might just want to take your time and just you know um, get you a driver who has his own vehicle that takes you around for a while until you get acclimated and everything and take your time and find a, a, a nice vehicle. That's what I did. All right. All praises. All praises. Yep. So, okay. Anybody? Oh. Jasmine. Aaliyah. Hey. Um, I'm sorry, Aaliyah. I said Jasmine. Aaliyah. Sorry. <laughs> I just um, wanted to ask you, um, how long did it take you to get acclimated to the way of living in Ghana? Because um, I know when I, my first time, sorry. You said get acclimated to what? Living in just, Ghana. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. Um, you were going to Because my first time going out of the country when I went to Turkey, um, even though like everything, the food, the water, everything was fresher. I don't know how, but I got sick like the second half of the time I was there. So that's yeah. always what I've been curious about is living in a different country. Like how did you, how long did that take? Yeah. When I first came on the trip, I got sick for a couple of days too. Um, so it is a, an adjustment, you know, where you, you might get an upset stomach or something like that. You know, they'll tell you that, it, oh, the water or something but i think it's just your body just having fresh organic food for real and drink and so sometimes it you might get a little upset stomach or something like that but it it doesn't last forever but it is an adjustment for some people they have it takes a little bit longer than others but um i'd say for me it wasn't it wasn't that long it was just a couple of days and then I was back up and at them. So it felt like um, a little bug, a little flu bug or something. That's what, what I experienced. So I think that that happens to quite a few people. And some people were fine. They didn't have any issues at all. Okay. I have a question. All right. Nisi. Oh, yeah. Were you about to say something else? No, I just said thank you. Oh, okay. No. Um. So I would ask, well, my question is, what about, because where you live in Ghana is, you know, more rural and out, mm -hmm. like not city. So yeah. I guess it could just vary person to person, but just to ask in general, would you say for those of us coming from the West, it would be an easier, softer landing to go to the cities? And like, if someone was planning to move there, it's a maybe spend some time in one of the bigger cities before moving out to where it's more rural, where kind of step it down. Um, but there's some of us here in the United States also live rurally, but I guess I'm talking about those yeah. of us coming from more urban 
or suburban settings. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, Ghana has, um, Accra is the capital city, and then Kumasi is another one of their bigger cities that's, um, that a lot of people will go to. Takarati is another that has a little bit more of the city life. So yes, I think, you know, and especially for the younger people, you know, who are used to, they just grew up in that environment and that's, that's what they know. I do agree that they might want to consider moving to the city first and then, you know, seeing if that's what they want to do, unless they are ready to move to a rural area, you know, because like even in living in the West, in the U.S., you know, we still were longing to get out of the hustle and bustle of the city, right? So, but where we are, we are building a fresh community. I mean, it's it's all brand new. So there's not going to be, you know, you can't just like in, maybe like in the, in the U.S., you know, just ride five minutes and you're at the grocery store. So it it is definitely a change, a difference. And then, you know, you have the markets, you have a lot of the villagers, you know, who are selling their wares on the street. And um, so it's a whole, you know, it's a whole different environment where I am versus um, say like in the city. Now in the city, you will find people who are selling their wares, you know, carrying them on their heads and selling them at the stoplights, right? When you stop for, for a light, the people just they come up and down the the road and they're sell, trying to sell you stuff while you're in your car you know so i mean you can get everything you can get underwear you can get towels you can get dishes <laughs> they have everything on their heads right selling you know it's like oh man that's right i forgot i need some more silverware you know <laughs> you can find that on somebody selling it on the road <laughs> why you know so um that's enough that's the that's the interesting part of it but yeah, the city, you know, I, I went to a couple of restaurants when I was in Accra last time that I hadn't gone to before. And and I drove into an area, I think it's called Osu or something like that. And it was really, really upscale and nice. And I hadn't seen that part of Accra before. And I was like, oh, this is really nice. And Rachel even said, wow, I can see why people want to live here because this is really nice. Um, great restaurants and, you know, parks and, you know, museums. And it was just really, really nice. So um, there is that part of Ghana that uh, you can experience. But that's a good question, Nisi. Thank you. I have a question. Um, yes, me. <clears throat> the place that you were just talking about, this is like the first question. Um, the first, the place that you were just talking about, do you know uh, what the rent is there or do you have to buy? Is there rent? Do you know how much it is? Uh, mm -hmm. not exactly, you mean like, but... in, like in the city in Accra? Yes. Yeah, I mean, Accra is expensive. Okay, so Accra is like your typical like New York in the States, right? So it's going to be expensive. However, right on the outside of Accra, like the suburbs, I guess we call it, you can get reasonable rent. The rent in, in Ghana, you pay the whole year. You pay, you pay it up front. You don't pay monthly rent. And some places will let you do six months, but most of the time you got to pay your whole rent for the, the year. So in Accra, that's, that could be very, very expensive to have to pay that at one time like that, because if you're paying a thousand dollars, equivalent of a thousand dollars, right, um, a month, then you got to come up with twelve thousand dollars. But you once you have paid it, then you're good for the whole year. Um, if you go. Yeah, if you go a little further out, then that is probably going to drop in half. Right. So. And if you're out here where I am in Cape Coast, where it's not fully, you know, not developed as much, but it's growing by leaps and bounds, but it's not developed as much. I was helping a lady get a house, um, three bedroom, one level, brand new house, and the rent was $200 a month. 
So you'd have to pay that, you know, it was 3,600 for a year. I mean, so, and it was a brand new house. Someone else was, we looked at a five bedroom house that was $400 a month. So yeah, the equivalent of $400 a month. So right now the dollar, uh, the, the money in Ghana is called CDs. So $1 is equal to 14 CDs right now. And that, really really high because it used to be hovering around eight nine ten right now it's one to 14. and so if people are going to come to ghana or going to buy in ghana going to build in ghana this is the time to do it while the you know the prices are uh the the dollar is so valued or yeah valued versus the cd they are they're expecting it to last that at least through the end of the year usually around december it always goes down so i'm thinking you know at least up until that point so if you wanted to even take a trip you know your your money would go so much further if you want to get those cute little dresses and outfits and all that right <laughs> you could you could do really good right now so ask rachel <laughs> <laughs> all those beautiful dresses <laughs> so another question is in your uh -huh. community yeah. um i know you haven't yet because you know me and you keep in contact with each other and these are just questions i'm asking that other people may want to know sure um in, in the community the hebrew heritage community that that you're yeah. building are there going to be um like Okay, say for instance, I moved here, right? Yeah. By myself, I'm by myself or whatever. Are you going to have um, houses that may be like small, you know, something for one person, um, or are you going to mm -hmm. have apartments, or what's your what's your plans? Um, yeah. For that community. Okay, so for the Hebrews Heritage Community, Phase One and Two is already sold out, right? So mm -hmm. those people are going to build their homes and we did not put any real um, requirements on the type of home that they would build, except it has to be something that we can build. So like we won't do container homes because we don't we don't um, build those and we don't um, think right now that that would be good for the community. I mean, for the person, because container homes are really, really hot um, and the weather. So, you know, just a lot of things like that. So. But right now for that community, they can pretty much do what they want. So for this next uh, phase, which is called Africa Bar Azafo, which will be um, four different sections of homes. And so you can get anything from a two bedroom to a five bedroom, right? And so you can, you can get the smallest home, one level, two bedroom, right? And or two story, five bedroom up to that, right? We also have just uh, talked about and just announced that we were, are doing what we call the, the small village or the tiny village homes. So we're gonna have a whole section where we're gonna have these small homes for people who, um, who wanna be in a tiny home or who wanna get here quickly and then build a bigger home um, or who just wanna be in a smaller community. And these are gonna be like these round houses like you see at a resort that have the mm -hmm. thatch roof mm -hmm. and um, they'll be very well made and there'll be um, a studio or a one bedroom. And those homes we're doing also because there are a lot of people who wanna come but they cannot afford to build a big home. Cause like I said, you gotta have the cash up front in Ghana, you don't have mortgages, right? So these homes are gonna run around 10,000 US and it's just gonna be just a round house a place where you will be able to come and just live and or if you just want to have it as a uh, place to come when you visit and then use as an Airbnb later. But we're going to create it as a where eventually it'll be like a sort of like a resort look to it where, you know, we'll have these round homes. We're going to have a community garden. We'll have um, eventually we, we our plan is to have like a community pool but it'll be a, like a whole little community of folks that can um, that will be together because our our goal is to have our people together. Right. 
and in community, true community, not like, well, I live in this subdivision, um, but I don't know anybody in the subdivision, right? Or I might know two people, but that's, it. you know, we're trying to keep it so that we will really get to fellowship together. We want to be able to have, hey, sweetheart. <laughs> we want to be able to have, um, you know, the feast days that we celebrate the feast days together, you know, that, you know, we may come out on, on Shabbat and somebody just blow the show so far out loud and everybody come out and we all just fellowship together and dance and have a good time. So that's, that's the vision that we have for it. But yeah, we do have a place for people who want to build, um, live in tiny homes, right? Or single homes. And we also encourage people to, and we do this on our call, once you purchase land, whatever, we have um, a call from time to time so that people get to know each other so they can start building these relationships before they come to the land. Um, we have we talked about on that call, if you know that you wanna come and you are single, maybe talk to somebody, find out if somebody else might want to partner with you to get a house together, right? Instead of everybody just buying and building their own thing and individuals living separate, you know, maybe you can be with somebody who a single mom, if, if you know, I know how it is for some of us, we don't want to have to deal with kids anymore. Right. <laughs> but, you know, you might want to be like a be like a single mom with I mean, live with a single mom with a kid or something like that and become grandma, you know, or, you know, two single um, women or men, you know, want to live together. Um, where you have like two separate, I think Jessica and Rachel talking about having two separate um, small homes that connect together with the outdoor um, patio or outdoor seating area where they're, you know, they're living on the same plot, living together, but they still are separate because they know, you know, at times when they're not going to want to be with each other. So just trying to be creative that way. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else? All right. So let me see. I'm looking at my list here to see. Um, oh, so Ghana is not the promised land. I just want to put that out there because some people are saying that it is. But I don't I say I don't believe it is. And the people in Ghana don't believe that it is the locals here, but they do know that Israelites are here. They do know that. And they will tell you, there are a lot of people when I first came, especially, and you know, you're introducing, getting to meet people. And I say, yeah, I'm a Hebrew Israelite. And they were like, well, so am I, you know? And I'm like, oh, really? I could, yeah, you know, and it's like, yeah, did you know that our people came here, you know, after the, the um, Moses crossed the Red Sea. Some of the people didn't make it and they came here to live. And I'm like, what? So they have this oral tradition that um, during that time the when the they were crossing the Red Sea, some of the people didn't go. I don't know if it was because they were afraid or they got they were too far behind. But when the time came for the soldiers to go rushing in um, and the waters came down, there were people that didn't make it. The, the part of the, the, the oral tradition also talks about the general who was in charge of those soldiers. He commanded them to go, but he didn't go. And when the waters came crashing down, he saw the power of the Most High Yah and he became a believer. I'm going to serve your, your uh, God, so to speak. And so he told the people who didn't make it, I will lead you to safety. They knew they couldn't go back to Egypt or go back to where Pharaoh was because he knew he would be killed, right? Because he failed. And so he they migrated and over time, they ended here in Ghana. And the area that my home is on right now is in a, a village or a town called Asebu. And that was the name of the, of the general. His name was um, Asebu Amenfe. And he became their king because you know how Israel, we're always making somebody else our king, right? <laughs> he became their king and 
he led them here and they established their community here in a Cebu, right on this where my house is sitting right now. I just praise y'all for that. That's just so um, wonderful to hear that story. When I heard that story the first time, I think I cried. Um, and so they became very, very rich and prosperous here. The Israelites were here in in um, in Ghana, along with the with the the Hamites, and they, you know, they lived here for a long time. And then there was a, I don't know what year, but there was a um, invasion of some other um, Africans, and they took over the entire area and overthrew it. But and then that's when they kind of went underground as Israel, but they still knew who know who they are. Um, and as um, a Cebu, a, a Memphi, they said he was a giant. You know, he was a giant of a man. He was big and strong and powerful. And so you can go to different parts of a Cebu and you can see like um, his handprint in a stone or something like that. You know, so they have the history and where he took a, something like a sword and jammed it in the ground and now they had nobody could ever get it out and stuff like that so they have all these stories about about him and how his sister eventually came here too and and did some some great things so that's how i mean so that's how we got here you know that's one of the ways you know we, we you know we also came down through portugal and spain through the slave you know uh when they were kicking the jews out and some of them came down this way, but there was already um, a group of people here in Ghana that were very, very um, prosperous and very, very smart, very, you know, the architecture, engineers, all that. So when the, the, the time for the transatlantic slave trade happened, they took those people to build America. Those who had that skill were taken to build America. So that's, that's the story that they tell. So they know their history. Now it's all mixed up. Some of it is all mixed up with um, the um, worship of the African worship. And so some of it, you know, you have to kind of step back and decipher and say, oh no, I, I'm, I'm not gonna. But they do have a strong, strong uh, spiritual um, environment. And they, they, everybody, I mean, the stores here called, um, blessed be Yah, I mean, well, blessed be God, you know, or um, I am I am his grocery store or, you know, all praises uh, to him, hair salon, you know, all the taxis have something about God on them, you know, I mean, they really have a, a spiritual um, environment. They, it's, it's embraced here. It's not, you know, something that you have to kind of almost be like on the down low, everybody, and they will pray with you. And I've met some, some Hebrew Israelites. And so here's another thing too, I found interesting. And I believe this is one of the reasons why the Most High is having us come here. Um, when they came here during the time of Moses, they, they did not get the story of the Redeemer, our Redeemer, Yahushua, right? Because there was no TV, no social media, no phones. So they couldn't hear, you know, hey, the Messiah is is in um in Jerusalem. You know, they wouldn't know. How would they know? So they to this to this day, a lot of them still believe they believe in Torah, they still are following the old covenant, right? And they don't know. And then when quote Jesus was introduced to them. He was introduced as a white man, right? So the colonizers came and introduced the uh, a savior as a white man. So he that they did a number on their minds. Now they think that that their savior is this white man. Some of them do. A lot of the Hebrew Israelites just rejected it altogether. So it's a challenge for them to now, you know, if we come in and we say that we believe in the Messiah. You know, then their thing is that that not that white man, you know, they're not going to have anything to do with that. So that's the the connection that I think would 
um, is one of the things that has to happen for the Israelites here. When we come, then we can introduce and show them, no, it, he was not, we know he wasn't this white man. And a lot of them know that he wasn't white, you know, too, but they still will have the, you know, big pit paintings and pictures of him all over the place, the, you know, the white Jesus. Um, so it's still pretty prevalent here. And the whole um, Christianity, um, lies, you know, are prevalent here where, you know, you see these people getting up every day. I mean, every Sunday going to church, you know, just like we used to do, but these people have to walk, you know, and they all dressed up in their Sunday best and they're walking with their kids and they go to these churches and give their money to the rich pastor who drives away in the Cadillac. So we see a lot of that, a lot of that here. So we have some some things we can, the, I believe the Most High will lead us to, to start to do once the people get comfortable with us being here. So another thing I'd like to share briefly is that, you know, we are coming back to the motherland, so to speak, right? We don't know if we're really Ghanaian or Nigerian or Togo, Togolese, I think they call it, or uh, Burkina Faso, or whatever, we don't know. We just know West Coast is where our people were taken from. Um, they don't have that history. They don't, they don't require them to go to the Cape Coast dungeon or the castle, you know, Elmina dungeon castle to find out about their history. They don't even have to go. So they don't, and they don't teach it to them in school, you know, that their people were taken away. Just like they only stopped with us with slavery. They, did, they didn't teach them what happened to their people from uh, the slave trade. They don't even, a lot of them don't even know much about the slave trade at all. And so when we come here, we're coming like, oh, I'm coming back to, you know, to my land, right? To, to my heritage, to my roots. And they don't necessarily see it that way. They see, they say a qua, but some, they say welcome home because they see our color, but they don't know what's in our heart that you know that desire to have um your feet on solid ground you know to be connected they just see us as uh people coming just like the white people the chinese people just coming over here to to get to you know to build and to make money and to you know um so that i think is something that people need to understand too because i know for me at first i was very offended when somebody would say something to me, like this one lady said, well, why would you want to come here? You know, why would you want to come to Ghana? You live in the US, why you want to come here? And I'm like, because this is where I'm from and my ancestors and blah, blah, blah. I go, went into this whole tirade, right? I could be your auntie for all you know. And she was like, oh, you know? So that was all what was, you know, in me. But to her, it's like, you living over there, good. Why you want to come over here? So they don't understand that. And that's another uh, bridge that um, that we need to close. You know, that gap needs to be closed so that they can understand why we are coming and why we, we wanna come and we wanna do and help and that we're not coming to take, take, take like some of the colonizers, right? But we're coming to, to support and give, all right? So any questions on that, thoughts before I go further? Um, right. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, because you've been there much, you know, now going on years, right? Like it's yeah. At least. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, you know, in the short amount of time that I visited, I, I, I I've heard it said, you know, like when we when we go over there, like then we're the white people because, mm -hmm. like you said, there is that disconnect. They yeah. don't see us like, you know, family. And so for me, I felt that that way. You know, some people felt yeah. like at home, like I'm I made it home, but you know, I didn't feel like that. I felt like an outsider. I was having a wonderful time, but as far mm -hmm. as like the locals are concerned, I didn't have that, you know, I felt like a, a foreigner. 
So I'm just, can you talk about what that was like for you? Like, when did you start to feel more like at home or do you still, does depend on where you go or what you're doing, do you still feel like a foreigner or, you know, O'Bruni as they call it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, or a white person. Somebody called me a white lady the other day. So, because to them, white lady means that you're wealthy, that you're rich, right? It doesn't mean color. So they call you, you know, if you're from the West, then they consider you white, you know, white lady, white man. Um, and some little kids were calling me, what do you call it, Bruni? Oh, Bruni. A Bruni. Some little kids would say, oh, a Bruni, a Bruni. And I had, I went over to them and I said, look at my skin. I'm the same color you are. I'm 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 not a brute. I'm not white. Um, so sometimes it just takes a little moment to just help them, you know. And I don't think they even understood what I was saying because they spoke far too. <laughs> but sometimes I, I, you know, you feel like you want to just kind of take that stand, you know, just to say, "Look, I'm just like you. I'm I'm back. I'm coming back home." Um, but for me, I had a few instances of that when I first came, especially when I was going around and people were trying to sell me stuff and they were being very kind of aggressive and um, being, uh, you know, raising the price and stuff like that. Uh, try And then trying to force me because I am a, a visitor or a foreigner, you know? So at first, you know, when, um, like when I would go places like the castle or tour sites, I felt it more there, but around in the village and and different places like that, I felt it a tiny bit every now and then. But one of the things that I began to realize was that the um, the behavior of the um, the Ghanaians and I will say especially the Ghanaian women is very passive, and sometimes it, it almost looks like they have like a scowl on their face right but it's but that's just their demeanor and, and it took me a while to to get it and so when i um over time as i realized that like if i saw someone i went somewhere and the person would be like they don't even want to help you in the store or you know they just seem so very standoffish um and now i realize that that's just their demeanor and because I observed them doing the same thing to the Ghanaians when they came in. So it wasn't that it was just because it was me. It's just that's how their demeanor is in some ways. And it's, it's sometimes it can be a little frustrating, but I get to the point now where I come in a little bit more um, jovial myself, right? I'll come in, you know, and speak and say something. And then, then they kind of lighten up. And then if the, if I go back to a place, then they know me and then it gets to be, oh, hey, mommy, how are you today? You know, so it it changes. But that was one of the things that I I had to come to grips with. The They're very quiet and, stand, you know, they seem standoffish, but that's the way they were raised under colonization. You don't talk. You keep to yourself. You know, you... Um, you don't speak unless you're spoken to. And so we're, we're um, there's a couple of people who have opened up uh, some customer service training centers because they're trying to help them to change that, to see that it's okay to speak to your customer. It's okay, you know, you don't have to come with your head down and not look at them. And that's part of that colonization. And so um, we see some of that changing, but recognizing what it, what it was, was major for me. Because at first, you know, right, I was like you, I was getting very offended. You know, it's like, y'all don't even feel like it, don't even seem like you want me here. And it wasn't that, it's, it's more so as that's just their behavior. It's like, don't, don't interact with the, the whites. So, yeah, does that help? Yes, thank you. You're welcome. Some of the other things that I notice here that I really like about um, Ghana is how much things they do relate to the word, right? Um, now they have a, um, when they are going to, when they have all the chiefs, well, first of all, let's say they have kings and queens here, right? And chiefs. 
So in the villages, each village has a paramount chief or a head chief. It could be um, a king or a queen. And they have um, chiefs and nanas all throughout the village. And um, they are the ones who really run the village. The government does not have authority over these people in terms of the land and stuff like that. They are the ones who they have control over their, their domain. And the king or the queen is over, she's the one or he's the one who gives out the land and who divvies it up to the villagers and stuff like that. They also have, um, they will have a palace. And if they don't um, have a palace, they will have a place where every month all the people come together and they bring their complaints and their concerns before the king. So to me, that was, you know, like in the Bible, in the word, you know, where um, the people would all come before Solomon to address their issues and concerns. And they they still do that here. Um, and that, you know, that's kind of exciting to me when I was like, oh, wow, that's just like how they did in the Bible. Um, and they do it. They they do it. And they come and they bring it. If they have an issue with, uh, um, you know, somebody's child or somebody, you know, whatever is going on, they bring it to before the, the congregation, so to speak, you know, but before the people and the elders are sitting up there along with the king or the queen and they give their input and they talk about the issues that go on. When we got our land for the Hebrews heritage community, we've got our land from a queen. Um, the queen of Brabetsi is the name of the village. And they invited us to come to uh, the village, I mean, to the to their palace. And when I say palace, guys, I am not talking about some big elaborate, I mean, we're talking about village life, okay? So the palace could be like a little storefront or something like that, you know, some little house. It's not, you know, these people are not wealthy, but they still know their position, right? So we went to a meeting and they they told us that um, they explained to us that this is their community, this is their village, this land that we are, you know, they're letting us live on is belongs to the most high, right? And that we have to uh, abide by the rules of the village. There's, there will be no using profanity out uh, in public. There will be no cut, I mean, no stealing. Um, you will respect your elders. I mean, they gave went down a list of things that they expected us to adhere to. And then on top of all of that, after that, they said, if you have any issues or problems, you bring it to the elders, you bring it to the queen. You don't take uh, Brabetsi business to the government or outside of Brabetsi um, because you know they are the ones who will rectify or decide what's going to happen in situations. And so I found that to be um, you know biblical as well. You know you you come and then you try to resolve your issues within the the community. And so that was that was really nice. They pour libations. You know, and so um, I know when um, I first came and they were doing a prayer and so they started pouring the libations. And so I just went to the scripture to just get a little bit of a um, history because I knew that there was something in the scripture about libations. You know, you pour libations to the most high. Um, um, so again, they may be pouring it. I don't know what they're saying in Fonte, but when they're doing it, I'm praying to the most high. <laughs> But but they do that. They pour libations. It's a sign to them that you're honoring. Um, the act of, they would say honoring the you know your ancestors. So you know at first that used to make me feel kind of uncomfortable too. But then I thought about when you read in the book um, in in the Torah and you see where the, when they would pray to the Most High, they would bring up Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. They always brought up the ancestors' names. Right. So it's similar, maybe not exactly the same, but the same mindset they're they're um, bringing to mind the ancestors that came before us that got the precious promises that we are walking in today. 
So um, they pour libations. And I heard somebody say this, and I thought it was interesting that when Yahushua was at um, the Last Supper, that's what they call the Last Supper, and he said, this is my blood, which is being poured out for you. And so somebody, you know, said that, like, if you look in the Hebrew and reading that, or not in the Hebrew, but uh, whatever that the New Testament would be in, but it signified libation pouring, like I'm pouring it out for you. And so I thought that was interesting because I always just looked at it like, you know, pouring it in a glass or something like that. But he was saying, this is my blood, which is being poured out for you. So they were saying that that was sort of like a libation as well. So I thought that was interesting, take it or leave it. But so that's one of the things that, uh, another one of the things that I saw that was, you know, was biblical. Um, we had a meeting, we had a, a big hoop to do here and we will be posting it soon of um, the Green Ghana Day. And they came here and they wanted to, they asked if they could use my house as the station where we all met and they planted, uh, they bought trees. They were supposed to bring me mango trees, but I didn't get them. But they bought coconut trees. They bought some teak wood and they were supposed to bring uh, pineapple. I didn't get that either, but they bought these trees and they had this, all these elders and, and chiefs were there. They were all dressed up in all their garb and everything. So you'll see on my Karen and Ghana um, soon. And we we went out, um, we all stood out in front of my house because they were going to plant the trees right across the street. Denise, y'all know where that is, where the, you know, where the coconuts are. So they had more coconut trees they were going to plant out there. And all these people and the Ghana Tourism uh, Authority was there, the Agriculture Council, I mean, all, all kinds of people, TV, press and all that. So. Um, after somebody said a prayer, you know, they opened up in prayer, you know, where they pray to, you know, um, in Jesus name. And then the chief said, you know, now he was going to do his prayer. And so he poured in saying it in Fonte, right? So, and then he poured out his libations and, and stuff. And so after everything was all over and we planted trees and y'all going to see me down there planting this little tree and I don't think that we have on video where I, <laughs> I put planted the tree and they wanted me to pour the water on the tree. And so I was pouring it and then he was like, pour it right. And so I, I was like, <laughs> what? I, I don't know how to pour it right. What do you want me to do? So he took the thing from me and he turned it around and he said, pour it with your hands. So <laughs> I started pouring water on my hand and he was like, no, no. <laughs> Not like that. And I was like, well, I don't know what you're talking about. So anyway, I don't think we have that on camera, but he was saying is he that when me oh, I'm sorry. Go is ahead. that when Rachel said that the tree was drowning in the process? Because I think <laughs> I think we do have that somewhere. I'll try oh, to find it. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, it was funny because I didn't know. And this, and you know, look, you know, for us ladies, I'm squatting down. And you know, after a while, my my legs are getting tired, and I'm squatting down trying to pour this water in in the right way. And I never could figure out what it was he wanted. He just took it from me and just did it himself at some point. <laughs> so anyway, that's that was a little funny aside. But anyway, I was sharing all that to say that after everything was all over and stuff, I went to Rachel. I said, Rachel, we need to take our wine and pray over it. And we're going to go out here and we're going to pour libations over top of those libations because we don't know what they were saying when they was praying over in front of my house. So we took our wine out and we prayed and poured our wine over top of that wine and we cast out any kind of spirits or anything that doesn't have anything to do with the Most High y'all and rededicated that whole area to the Most High. So, you know, because I don't know what they were saying. And I don't know who they were pouring libations to, but I know scripturally you can pour libations to y'all. And so that's what we did. So uh, that was funny, but funny and wonderful. 
you know, because it was, and then Rachel brought the, the shofar and she blew the shofar and stuff. It was great. It was great. It was just me and her, but we, we reclaimed that thing, boy. We reclaimed this land for the most high y'all. Hallelujah. Hey, Alexis, I think your hand is up. Yes. Shalom, Sister Karen. Hey. That story that you just told, I can't help but ask you now, what has the language barrier been like for you and mm. how are you working to learn the language that they yeah. speak? That's a really good question. So the language barrier can be a challenge. Most of them speak English, but really basic, right? So they may understand, you know, what you're saying some of the time, but they will act like they understand what you're saying all of the time. And that can be a challenge because they'll be saying, yes, yes. And you'll just be talking, they'll be like, yes, yes. Okay, mom, okay. And then you find out they don't even know what you're talking about. They don't have a clue. And so they might go off and do something totally opposite than what you asked them to do. Uh, possible is my it's my help, my guy who comes and works for uh, for me. And he was famous for that at first. He doesn't do it as much anymore, but he was famous for that to be like, yes, mom, yes, yes. And then go do the complete opposite of what I asked him because he didn't want to say he didn't know what I was talking about. So he's going to try to figure it out as he goes or something like that. Um, as far as what I'm doing, I was taking a Fonte class. I had a young lady come here and she was teaching me Fonte. Um, and that was that was good. That was really helpful for some of the basic things. So out of the whole time that she was coming, I, I know how to say, you know, like, good morning. How are you? I know how to say bye, uh, go and come. You know, so some basic things like that. Um, please. And, uh, but not a lot. I don't know a lot. So I, I keep saying I'm going to start taking the classes again, but I just haven't done it. Uh, at some point she had, um, had to stop coming for teaching to teach me. And so we never got back together. But like I say, most of the time you can, um, find that people will know a, enough of the language to understand basically what you're saying. But sometimes if you go to the village and you want to purchase something, that person might not speak uh, any English at all. So that can be really challenging. It can also be pretty funny too. You know, you're trying to, both of you trying to communicate with you, with each other and neither one of you know what you're saying. But um, so you're, you're using your hands and pointing, you know, and all that. So, but it's it's not too bad. The other thing that I that helps a lot is to have someone with you, a local person with you who does speak the language. Pretty much, you know, especially at first, wherever you go, and they and and that's going to be easy here because the people here are so accommodating. Um, you will you will never open a car door if you're around a Ghanaian man. You're not going to open your own car. You're not going to take in your own groceries. They'll even carry your purse gladly carry your purse, you know, in around the store. Um, they will, you know, they do so much for you. My girlfriends, I just had two girlfriends come, Denise and Denise. Uh, I've been knowing them for over 30 years and they both came to visit me together. And they kept saying, I just feel so guilty because I can't do anything. They won't even let me get out the car. I'm saying, well, just enjoy it. Just take it in, you know? You're being treated like a, the queen that you are, you know, <laughs> accept it, you know. And so um, after a few days, they got into it, though. <laughs> they got into it. So but they wanted to like, you know, you couldn't wash. Then possible is not, not going to let you wash a dish. He's not going to let you, you know, cook unless we make a plan to cook. But you don't just get up. You don't make your own coffee, you, you know. So it's like it's it's like living large, you know, it's it's nice. That part is nice. But but the other part of it is I have someone that I can take with me to um, when I go to the store and they will they they will do the negotiating for me. So if I see something I like, uh, especially at the market where they can, you know, come down on the price, they'll say a price and they'll say, no, come down, come down. And then they do the negotiating uh, at first. So now I do my own negotiating you know, when I go to the market. So, 
So sometimes I think I know what I'm doing. It's, uh oh, so my battery's getting low, guys, and I don't have um, power yet. So I might have to either call on my phone if I drop. But I didn't have much more to talk about anyway. Oh, you know, I was going to talk about this. There, are, there are some people, not a whole whole lot, but you'll see people on the road, like homeless people. Um, but it reminds me of the Bible because they look like the demoniacs, right? Because they are, they're totally disheveled. Their clothes are really dirty. Um, they look like they're out of their minds. And so it reminds me of Yahushua when he would see somebody on the road, you know, and um, he would cast, tell a demon to come out of her, most things like that. Um, and so that's what I do when I see him, you know, I say, to, you know, I say not like screaming it out loud or anything, but um, I just cast, you know, I just I cast that demon out of that lady. You come out of her, you know, or something like that. <laughs> Thinking about how Yahushua did it, right? Um, but I haven't had the opportunity because they don't speak my language to go to them and talk to them and say, do you want to be delivered? You know, like he did or sometimes, but um, there is that that piece too that just sort of reminds me of, of the word. Um, the thing is the land belongs to the most high, not to man. So when you're here in Ghana, you get a deed for uh, 55 years to be renewed, but uh, if you are not a Ghanaian, 99 years if you are a citizen. And that is because they say the land belongs to the Most High, it does not belong to them. So they can't sell you land, they can lease you land. And it's like that in lots of African countries. Okay. When you come before the king or the queen, you are supposed to bring a gift. You should not go before the king or the queen, especially in a, um, uh, a serious capacity. Like I know Queen Moy, I can go over her house anytime. I'm not going to bring her a gift every time I go. But when you're going to see someone to present yourself before a king or meet them, you should always come with something in your hand. You don't come empty handed. And that's biblical as well. You know, you present your gifts to the king. Um, you know, our king, we, we present, you know, worship and stuff like that. But yeah, you present your gifts to the king. And I talked about how some, you know, they have the, they're very spiritual people, but some of it is mixed, you know, with some of the um, ancestral worship and things like that. So you just have to kind of be careful um of what, you know, what you're participating in. And like I said, you know, it's just like if you go to a different church and you don't know, really know what they believe and they might say something that's a little off and you just say, I'm up under your breath, well, I rebuke that, you know, or I don't, you know, y'all, you know, I believe, you know, so it's the same kind of thing. You don't have to fear it or anything like that. Some people come and they they get really deeply involved in the in that in the spiritual aspect of it. But we know who we are. We belong to the Most High Yah. So some of those people are not His, and so they're going to worship their own God. So I don't get all caught up in it and trying to you know condemn them or anything like that because everybody don't belong to Yah. And so we you know especially I'm over here in another uh, uh, country across the waters, I don't know who belongs to him or who doesn't. I just know what I believe and the people around me, you know, what I teach them. So I, you get an opportunity to share the truth to the people um, when you are with them one-on-one. -on -one. I have yet to go to a Hebrew Israelite um, assembly, but my business partner, uh, his brother has an assembly in one of the villages. And so I plan to, to do that one day. Um, and then there's also, um, uh, my, the laundry guy, you know, because I don't do my laundry either. Y'all <laughs> I got so spoiled. <laughs> I, <don't> do <laughs> I do wash my own clothes, but all my, you know, my towels, sheets, all that kind of stuff. They go to the laundry because they, they iron my towels and they iron my sheets and stuff. So, <laughs> so it comes back, everything all nice and neat and all smelling good and stuff. So, you know. That's what I do. So come to Ghana and live large like me, y'all. <laughs> so anybody have any questions? That's about it for me, what I was going to share about that part.
Hey, Jasmine. Now I'm calling the right name. Hey, Jazzy Jazz. Hey, Sister Karen. How you doing? Good, baby. Awesome. Um, I had, I think I have three questions, and I'm sorry if somebody answered it or asked it already. One, how's the food? Is it is it significantly better than here? Yeah. Two, has being like so close, like literally in a kingdom where you're seeing kings and queens often, has it made the scripture come to life more? And the last one, um, it looked like you cut your hair. Did you cut your hair? I it did. Looks nice. It looks good. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, I did cut my hair. Was that the last question? Yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> All right. So the first one, the food, the food is awesome. Okay. But it's very um, they don't have a lot of variety like we do in the States. Um, so I mean they do have it, but not uh like as their staple, as their regular food. They they're big on rice and chicken and fish. Right. And and goat. All right. And lamb. So those are the those are the meats and and but they they're big on uh, um, they make soup. They're big on soups like they have a groundnut soup that is. Oh, my goodness, it's so good. And it's made out of peanut butter, but it doesn't taste like peanut butter to me. To some people, they say it does. But and then they put chicken in it and it's thick. And then you take they make a rice ball. And then you break off a piece of the rice and dip it down in it and eat because they eat with their hands here a lot, which was hard for me at first. But I'm getting I'm, I'm in it now. <laughs> and um, so and I just heard the other day, I don't know how true it is, but they said the fried rice started in Africa, not in China. So just so y'all know. They stole that, too. <laughs> um, but the food is really good here. They have the jollof rice and fried rice, and they have uh, the fish. They cook their fish whole, you know, so that was another thing you get used to. But you get this big old red snapper on your plate, and you just, you know, pull it off and just eat it. And, you know, so the food I love. I love the food. They have something called banku, and then they um, something called fufu, and that's uh, like a soft kind of dough made one is made out of corn one's made out of flour and you just pull it off and dip it in your your food and you use it sort of like your spoon to get your food they have this great um this leaf called contumery and it's sort of like a cross between spinach and collard and it grows huge and you cut that boy up and put it in and saute it with some they will take it and they will uh, put it in palm oil, which is a different kind of that red oil that they cook their food in. And then they will put um, what they call garden eggs, which looks like little small, um, what do you call them? Eggplant. And they cut that up and put that in there. And then they will uh, put an egg, scramble an egg up in there too. That thing is, that's the, that is so good. It is so good. So I love the food, as you can tell. <laughs> And uh, what was your other question? Oh, about um, the Bible. Yeah. Yeah. Has it felt yeah. like it's come more to life because you're so close or in a kingdom? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. That's what I was sharing. I, you probably missed some of that. But yeah, I was sharing some of the things that make it seem so much like at the Bible. You know, you can read. I mean, you can um, see how uh, even how they present themselves like. The, you know, if you go to the king's house or to the palace, you know, especially if he has on his, um, uh, you know, his garb, his priestly garb or kingly garb, um, you come with a different, you come with a persona. You have to come and you have to say, I can't remember the Fonte word, but almost like, um, can I enter or something like that. And then he has to welcome you. And he does that through his liaison. He doesn't speak to you. He speaks to his right-hand man and his right-hand man will speak to you. So that's sort of like, you know, Yahushua is the right hand of the father, right? Oh, I love it. And so he will speak to you and say, you may enter. And so then you come in and you sit down and then the liaison will say, why are you here? 
what brings you here? And so um, Emmanuel, my business partner, was explaining to me that um, they, that they would ask that because you could be coming from another village or from another area and you might need a place to stay. You know, you might be on the run or something like that. And so if they say, well, why are you here? Then you tell them that I'm from so-and-so village and I need a place to stay for a few days. And then they, they have rooms in the palace where people can, strangers can come and stay. And so, um, but they do ask you, why are you here? So if we come to, to, um, maybe pay, say we come to pay the king for the land or something like that. So we would tell them that that's why we come. And the king's sitting right there, you know, holding his little staff, you know, and he hears everything, but you still go through, you know, the, the right-hand man. And then um, after a while, then the king will start to talk directly to us, right? And so now when I come, you know, he, he is very casual and he'll, we still have to do the same thing. You still have to always do that. But then right after that, then he'll say, oh, the boss lady's here. Hey, Miss Karen, you know, how are you today? You know, and he's always talking about I'm the boss. But um, yeah, so that part is really, that was another thing I didn't mention earlier that shows me uh, so much of uh, biblical um, ways of doing things, especially when it comes down to the king. But thanks for asking. That's what's up, yeah. It's amazing. It's amazing. And it, I it apologize if you repeat it. That's okay. No, it's not a problem. It's, it feels really feels like living in uh, in the word. It just just you're just here, you know, you're just living in it. And it's it's really a nice, a nice, nice feeling. So oh, crazy. Anybody Thank else? You. Guys, I think my phone, my computer is going to die at any moment. So I just want to, I'll just end here and say thank y'all so, so, so much for allowing me to come and talk to you guys. And I'll come back again another time. Um, if you, if, you know, if you have other questions or you want, you know, want me to talk more about how it is here in Ghana. Love you, We love you, sis. We love you, Karen. Love you. Thank oh, you. Thank you. Thank you. Love you. Love you. Love you. Love you. Love you. Don't forget to go and subscribe to my channel, Karen and Ghana, on YouTube, please. I'm yeah. almost at 4,000. I need like 80 people to sign up. All right. All right. So tell your friends. All right. <laughs> Hello. Love you, mommy. Love you. Tell Love you. 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 Love you.